And where did you come from? Uh, <clears throat> well, I was born in Louisiana, in the uh, south, in Monroe, Louisiana. And uh, I came, uh, my family uh, came to Oakland uh, when I was about one and a half. So uh, I've been here about, what, 34 years. I'm 35 now. Uh, I'm an old man. <laughs> but uh, I, I went to about every school in Oakland. We moved a lot. What was it like in your school? We were, we were being taught mostly about white people. We didn't have any books of our own. So uh, it wasn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't feel that, um, that the school uh, was teaching us anything about ourselves. So uh, it was a great problem uh, in school for me and for the uh, teachers. And um, that's why as I grew older, I always felt that uh, uh, as I grew older and learned about our true history, that uh, Africa, uh, before its conquest, was a beautiful, uh, cultured country. And uh, we had great universities uh, in Timbuktu. And I started to look at myself and get a new interest in, uh, in, uh, in education. And uh, so that's one of the reasons that I'm so proud of uh, your school. Wings to Fly is a children's book about gaining confidence and working to succeed. Told from the perspective of a young girl who loves to play basketball. She is often left out by her teammates until she meets her guardian angel who teaches her that success takes perseverance. Wings to Fly is a great read for all children. I would highly recommend this book. If you would like to make a purchase, please click on the link in my description box below. Huey Percy Newton was born February 17, 1942 from Monroe, Louisiana. Due to racial discrimination and lots of violence against blacks, his family moved from Louisiana to Oakland, California. This was during the second wave of the Great Migration. Huey grew up committing many crimes. He was a very troubled youth. And in his own words, from his autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide, Huey states, During those long years in Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Not one instructor ever awoke me in a desire to learn more or to question or to explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was try to rob me of my sense of my own uniqueness and worth, and in the process, nearly killed my urge to inquire. Huey bought several books on criminal law, burglary, and felony. He looked up as much as possible and tried to find out what kind of evidence was needed, what things were actually considered violations of the law, what the loopholes were, and what you can do to avoid being charged at all. But as a troubled young man, Huey still had one foot going down the right path and one foot in the streets. But the brother was trying. So Huey was robbing people, Huey was vandalizing, Huey was burglarizing, he was stealing. He would go into certain neighborhoods and break into people's homes, mostly white neighborhoods. Huey hung around the wrong folks who got him into lots of stuff. And he was always fighting. I mean, always fighting. One day, Huey was at a gathering with a bunch of people, and he began arguing with a man named Odell. Odell was a bully, and he started to press Huey. They were face to face, and Huey turned his back on him and began sitting down eating his dinner. Huey had a steak knife because he was cutting his steak. Odell snatched him by the arm and said, don't you ever turn your back on me. Huey turned his back again. Odell said, you must don't know who the hell you talking to. Odell began reaching towards his hip as if he was about to pull a gun. Huey told him, don't you draw a weapon while I got this knife on me. 
Huey lunged at him and began stabbing him several times before he can even get a chance. Huey was later arrested and he was indicted for assault with a deadly weapon. Huey and his team fought for self-defense and he ended up getting off. He served about 22 months. Out of jail and back on the streets in 1965, he hooked up with Bobby Seale. Only our brother Martin Luther King exhausted a means of nonviolence with his life being taken by some racist. What is being done to us is what we hate. And what happened to Martin Luther King is what we hate. You darn right. We respect nonviolence. But to sit and watch ourselves be slaughtered like our brother, we must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. See, he had known Bobby from back in the day. And now they had a lot to talk about. They haven't seen each other in about a year. He and Bobby used to always disagree but they were close. He had recruited Bobby into the Afro-American Association. Him and Bobby were involved in many different organizations before they created the Black Panthers. They were having a lot of meetings in Bobby Seale's living room. That was kind of like their headquarters. They all would sit in there and bounce ideas off of one another for hours and hours and hours. They would read tons of books, put their heads together, and try to come up with a plan. They studied everybody. They studied MLK. They studied Malcolm. They studied people like the Deacons of Defense. In 1964, the desegregation of Jonesboro, Louisiana High School was threatened by local authorities with fire hoses. Four armed black men arrived with loaded shotguns. Without firing a shot, the mob dispersed and the authorities retreated. The students entered the school without incident. Those men were members of the Deacons for Defense, an armed citizens militia founded in Jonesboro, Louisiana. The Deacons were everyday citizens who by 1965 had organized into more than 50 chapters throughout the South in self-defense from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1964, down in Louisiana, there were all types of demonstrations going on by Freedom Riders. Many times, the demonstrations would be met by armed white resistance. People were dying and being shot and intimidated because they were unarmed and basically because they were unarmed they were also being denied the right to vote. The Deacons protected civil rights workers for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who were registering voters in Louisiana and Mississippi. They patrolled black neighborhoods and protected black churches where CORE was holding voting rights seminars. These were regular, everyday people. They were not some paramilitary group. The thing that made them different is they were veterans from the Korean War. They were veterans from World War II. And so they did have the training and they did have the discipline. They came from being veterans. Once the Klansman and the white citizen counselor and the deputy sheriff that was wearing the sheet at night learned that these deacons for defense would shoot back, then they were not as readily willing to go and pounce upon them in the wee hours of the morning. Are you going to do something about it? Because now they knew that, well, the right to bear arms is providing constitutional rights for these blacks, irrespective of the fact that we want to take away their civil rights. They're fighting on solid ground. The effectiveness of the Deacons in deterring violence was so great that Dr. Martin Luther King and Floyd McKissick of CORE hired the Deacons to protect the marchers from Klan aggression in the 1966 March Against Fear. The very effect 
of armed resistance in the name of civil rights is what really casts a new enthusiasm into the civil rights movement at a critical time. They looked into this political group called Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and they had a Black Panther for its symbol. A few days later, while him and Bobby was meeting, Huey suggested that they use the Black Panther as their symbol and call our political vehicle the Black Panther Party. The panther is a fierce animal, but he will not attack unless he is backed into a corner. Then he will strike out. This image seemed appropriate, and Bobby agreed without discussion. Now they began recruiting heavy. All through the neighborhoods and the local colleges, the recruitment was on. <laughs> 